Salutations, respected viewers. This is Stuart from Ireland, and here I am in front of a statue of Emmeline Pankhurst. One of my uh, faithful uh, viewers asked me to make a video about Emmeline Pankhurst, and there she is. Born 1858 in Moss Side, Manchester, and uh, she died uh, 90 years ago uh, this month, 13th of July. Though she claimed she was actually born on the 14th of July, in Bastille Day, and this uh, made her aim towards revolution. Um, anyway, this monument has got the symbol of the WSPU prisoners, Women's Social and Political Union, with a um, portcullis, which is a symbol of the House of Parliament, and an arrow on it, as in they used to wear these if they were in prison on their uniform as well. Didn't she? choose to wear that was on the uniform and then uh, here there's an image of her other her daughter one of her daughters Christabel her eldest one and her dates so uh, anyway Emmeline Pankhurst is best known for campaigning for votes for women um, and she was brought up in a politically active family at the age of 14 she became um, aware of this campaign so uh, women's suffrage was, was not entirely new in the United Kingdom um, medieval legislation had said the best men shall choose from amongst themselves two knights from each shire, two burghers from each borough, burger meaning a leading citizen. But um, the, the Latin word for men could be interpreted to mean people, and the right to vote was uh, uh, restricted to very wealthy property holders. Um, and therefore some women who owned substantial uh, landed property were allowed to vote in the Middle Ages. It was a microscopically small proportion of the population, but nevertheless it established the principle. Obviously most men couldn't vote, no more than 5%, and a tiny, tiny number of women. Uh, indeed, the House of Lords had major landowners there, who would be aristocrats, some of them would be bishops and archbishops, um, abbots, because they ran monasteries, and monasteries owned huge tracts of farmland but also abbesses, as in a nun who uh, controlled an abbey and therefore a huge amount of farmland. So there were even women in medieval parliaments. Um, but by the late 16th century, women had been stripped of their right to vote. Um, in, in the um, British Commonwealth um, of uh, the 1650s, some women wrote to Cromwell asking that they be allowed to vote, and Parliament wrote back saying, meddle with your housewifery. Women had absolutely no business um, getting involved in politics. France in the 1790s briefly exper uh, experimented with female suffrage. Sweden in the mid-18th century allowed women who owned uh, a significant amount of real property to vote. Um, anyway, the 1832 Great Reform Act um, tightened up the situation and it restricted voting to male persons above a certain amount of wealth. So um, Emmeline Pankhurst, uh, she was a highly educated woman. She married Richard Pankhurst. Incidentally, her maiden name was Goulden, who was a barrister. They're both Liberal Party members. And um, he argued a case that women ought to be permitted to vote, and a judge found that a woman was personally incapable of doing so. Even if she satisfied the other uh, criteria, such as being over 21, being of sound mind, being a British subject, being resident in the same house for over, tw for over a year, owning or renting a sufficient value of property and so forth. As a female, she was disbarred by that criterion from voting. Um, anyway, uh, so she was also somewhat involved in the anti-slavery campaign, um, uh, Emmeline Pankhurst. It had been banned throughout the British Empire, but to ban it in the rest of the world as well. Um, so fast forward a bit, they moved to London, she owned a shop, uh, they lived near Russell Square. Her husband's often commuting back to Manchester for his legal practice. They became disillusioned with the, La with the, with the Liberal Party. They, they were briefly involved with the Independent Labour Party. She tried to join, um, but she was banned from a local branch on the grounds of her sex, but she was allowed to join the National Party. Um, so she eventually formed the Women's Social and Political Union. There's also the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, and, and some men were part of that. Men were not in the WSPU. And you can see the colours there for nature, purity and dignity in that order. That's what they signify. Um, so peaceful campaigning and letter writing and meetings was doing no good. They turned to militancy in the um, years leading up to the First World War. They didn't actually kill anyone. Well, Emily Wilding Davison killed herself in front of the King's horse, although that might have been an accident on her part, not deliberately getting killed, but smashing windows, throwing bricks at the windows about downing street pouring weed killer on golf courses um, 
burning down pavilions. I, I, I shall go on. So she was in jail sometimes. There was the um, Prisoners Discharge of Ill Health Act because they um, refused to eat. They went on hunger strikes. They were force fed. And uh, this generated some sympathy in the public. The government was worried about force feeding going wrong and accidentally killing one of the WSPU prisoners. So they let them out till they start eating, regain their health, and then rearrest them, send them back to prison. The Cat and Mouse Act, as it became commonly known, it was later used against the IRA after the First World War. So um, her daughters, Christabel, Sylvia, and Adela, were heavily involved. She later had a falling out with Adela and severely punished Adela by sending her to Australia. Um, Anyway, the First World War came along and um, the WSPU suspended all their activities and they completely threw themselves into, into uh, pro-war activism. And the uh, WSPU's magazine, Women's Dreadnought, renamed itself Britannia and it became the most fervently nationalist publication. And uh, she was always campaigning against people who were pro-German, as she called them. They thought about women being allowed to volunteer to fight on the front line because in, in Russia this was allowed by 1917, the Women's Death Battalion. Um, she split with her daughter Sylvia, who was a socialist, uh, who thought the war was just um, about capitalist exploitation. Very uh, conveniently, she named her daughters in alphabetical order, the one with C before S. And the one with a C the initial became a conservative, the one with the S initial became a socialist. Never mind Adela and uh, her son, who died young. There was another son who lived on, but he was not politically active. Um, anyway, because of her fervent patriotism, a lot of people withdrew their, their, their opposition to what she was doing and found it less embarrassing. It wasn't such a come down. So, um, towards the end of the First World War, she was going to get what she wanted. But there was some disagreement about what concessions should be made. Should women be allowed to vote but not to stand for Parliament? Should it be women for only over a certain age, a certain education level, or owned a certain amount of property? And this is the worry about um, amongst some socialists, is that only bourgeois women will be granted the franchise, and that would simply help the Conservative Party to a lesser extent the Liberals. Anyway, April 1918, the Representation of the People Act, there have been several iterations of that, but the 1918 version granted the right to women to vote uh, for parliamentary elections if they were over 30, if they're on the local government register or married to a man who was. I should have pointed out that from the 1880s, women were allowed to vote in local elections for their local council, county council or city council, for the mayor. Women could be elected to the local council, they could even be mayor of their city. But they're not allowed to vote in parliamentary elections because they're saying, oh, well, local government's about the private sphere and national government's about the public sphere. Uh, there isn't a clear distinction there. It's, it's illogical, I know. But that was it. There'd even been a, a women's league for opposing female suffrage. Uh, so she got her way. And um, in 1918, uh, women were elected to Parliament. Well, Countess Markovic was elected for an Irish constituency for Sinn Féin, but she never took a seat in Parliament, which stands just over there, because she refused to take an oath of allegiance to King George V behind the trees as Parliament. So the first woman to take her seat was um, Lady Nancy Astor, because um, uh, she was a, an American woman here, married to a British aristocrat. Her husband was elevated to the House of Lords, so she got elected for his Plymouth constituency. So um, then after the First World War, she became very conservative. She'd gone through such a political od odyssey, but mainly she was involved um, in religious fundamentalism. So she was a mad, keen, Christian. She spent a lot of time in the United States. She'd been campaigning for women's suffrage over there as well. So she died in 1928 um, and um, it was just when they were going to bring in um, w voting on an equal footing, as in women and men of 21. Previously the Conservative government had said we can't allow women under, t under the age of 30 to vote because they're flappers. Anyway, this memorial was erected only two years after she died, unveiled by Stanley Baldwin, the um, former Conservative Prime Minister who had been at one stage an inveterate opponent of women's suffrage. Well, there she is, Emmeline Pankhurst.